Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. I'm just about at the end of a series that I've been doing for six weeks on financial stewardship. And this is the teaching that I have. Tomorrow is going to be my last day to offer this. This is a DVD set as seen on TV. They were taken from the TV programs. And then I have a CD set that is this teaching that I have done. I think that there are um, six teachings in this. And then I have a book on this in English and in Spanish. And then I also have a study guide and we have a DVD that is the testimony of six people who have just uh, seen miraculous results in this area of finances. Tomorrow's gonna be our last day to offer these. And I do wanna encourage you that this is really good. I know some of you think I've seen the programs. Why do I need this material? Because these programs are broken into little 30 minute segments and you just lose something when you don't get the, you know, the full teaching uh, all at one time. And plus, it's a great way to go back over this, and these materials are a tremendous way to share this truth with someone else. And I tell you, we need some breakthroughs in this area of finance. So I really encourage you to please go to the effort of getting these materials. Tomorrow will be our last day to make these offers over television. Now, I've been talking all of this week about the power of partnership. And I've said a lot of things from Ephesians, uh, I mean, excuse me, Philippians chapter one and chapter four, and Proverbs 18, 16, 19, 6, we took the example of the Queen of Sheba going to King Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 10. And all of these, I, what I was doing was trying to say that when you give to a ministry, when you become partners, and I am making a distinction between just a one-time gift. Uh, there, when you give a one-time gift, it's not that you don't become a partner, but it's that you haven't tapped into our united with that ministry the same as somebody who just does this on a consistent, deliberate, regular basis. I was sharing some things the other day about how our ministry really depends upon these people who pledge support on a monthly basis. That's how we evaluate and make determinations about what our income is going to allow us to do. And so, uh, there is a difference, I believe, between a person who just, say, for instance, orders something like we make all of our materials available for a gift of any amount. And uh, when we do that, some people, we've actually had people send in buttons before that send in a dollar or something. There are some people that send in enough money to cover what they think that, you know, is necessary for that um, piece of uh, material that they're getting. But I don't really consider those partners. I consider those people who have given and helped us. But a partner is somebody who gives beyond the uh, money that it costs to get materials to them and minister to them. A partner is somebody who's helping us reach beyond them to other people and is helping us get the gospel out. And so I've been sharing all of these things about that. I want to turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And this is where David and his men had returned to Ziklag, the city that they were living in. The Amalekites had come in and had overcome the city. While all of the men were gone to war, they came in and took and spoiled the entire thing. They burned all of the houses, but they took anything of a value. They took the women, the children, and the Amalekites escaped. And so David pursued after them and... Um, Here's what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 9. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint they could not go over the brook Besor. And so the rest of the story goes on to talk about how that they came upon the Amalekites and they recovered everything. They didn't lose the lives of any of their women and children. They recovered all of these captives and they not only got back all of the stuff that they had, but they spoiled the Amalekites and this was a great, great victory. So as they were coming back from this victory, it says in verse 20, and David took all of the flocks and the herds which drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. And David came to the 200 men which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Bezor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. 
Then answered all of the wicked men of Belial. In other words, this shows you that what they're about to say right here was not godly counsel. And they said, uh, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, you shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken to you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance in Israel unto this day. So here's the story that 200 of David's men were so weak that they couldn't cross over this uh, river to pursue the enemy. So they left them there to keep, uh, take care of all of the stuff. And then David and 400 of his men pursued after the Amalekites. They won the battle and they got this huge amount of spoil. But the ungodly men among them, they wanted to give back to these 200 men who didn't go to the battle. They weren't going to give them any of the spoil. They were going to let them take back their wives and their children that they had recovered from the Amalekites, but they weren't going to let them participate in the spoil. And David spoke against this and he says, nobody is going to listen to you in this. God is the one that rewarded us. And he split the spoil equally among the 600 men, not only the 400 that went to battle, but also the 200 that guarded the stuff. And the application of this to what I'm talking about is that, you know, not everybody can go on television or travel and minister the word or pastor a church or go to a mission field and do these things. But we could not do what we're doing if it wasn't for the people who give and support us and help send us. As a matter of fact, let me turn over here to Romans chapter 10. This exact same thing is said by the Apostle Paul. And he said in Romans chapter 10 and in verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah saith, Lord who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So those passages of scripture show that a person can't believe until they hear. They can't hear unless somebody preaches and they can't preach unless they be sent. See, this is the same thing. These people could not have gone and have pursued the enemy without having these people that stayed by the stuff. You know, in the military, I was in the military and I was out on a fire support base the majority of the time, but I would come back to the rear area and there were people back there that never fought. They never carried a weapon. They never fired at anybody, but they were absolutely essential to the effort. You had to have this, all of this support uh, stuff back in the rear area that, you know, they would send the supplies and all of these things out to the front line. And that support line, that supply line is vital to a military campaign. Uh, if you've studied any battles at all, you'll know that many battles have been lost because the people were able to cut off their supply line. And if you can do that, well, then eventually the, those people are at your mercy because they cannot fight without a constant supply. It's the same thing in the gospel. Not everybody can go. God doesn't call everybody to go, but he does call everybody to participate and if you aren't the one that's out on the front line that's actually preaching the gospel and dealing with all of these things, then everybody is called to send those other people to accomplish those things. You know, in our Bible college, I try and tell our students often that I don't want everybody that comes through Bible college to be a uh, preacher. Now, I, I love being a minister. I think it's the greatest calling that there is. And I'm excited when other people uh, feel that that's what God called them to do. But you know what? We need other people to get things done. Right now we have, I forget the exact number, but it's over 300 employees here in Colorado Springs. And you know what? Not all of them are on television. Matter of fact, none of them are on television but me. But it takes 320 or so people to help me do what I'm doing. 
the people that are running our camera right now. You know what? I couldn't do what I was doing if it wasn't for Stephen Bransford that runs our television department, for the people that are running all of our computers to record this program, the people that edit it, the people that ship these things out. We've got hundreds of people that answer our phones and pray with people. And I tell you, they minister to more people than most pastors do. We've got people that clean our facility. And I think that that's really important. God has given us a wonderful facility. And if we just trash it, I don't know why God would give me anything else. If I don't take care of what I've got, if I'm not faithful with what I have, who's going to give me more is what it says over in Luke chapter 16. It's, it's important down to the people that clean the floors, that clean the toilets, that take care of everything. We need people like that. And we need some people who may not even be working for a ministry as such, but they are out in the secular world. They're making a living and God is blessing them financially and they are sending and enabling me to go on television and to bring people to the Bible college and train people. And they are an important part of what's going on. Sometimes people don't see that. They think that because they aren't on the front lines, because they aren't the one on television, that therefore they aren't in full-time ministry. And I try and tell all of our employees constantly that you are in full-time ministry. I don't care if you're answering the phones, cleaning the toilets, what it is that you're doing. We couldn't do what we do without every single person. And likewise, you may feel like, well, I'm not in the ministry, but you are called to support it. How could we go? How can we do what we do without people supporting us? You know, it's expensive to be on television. And I couldn't do that if it wasn't for people who sent us, just like it says here in Romans chapter 10. How can they preach except they be sent? So I liken this illustration over here where David had 200 of his army stay by the stuff. The other 400 went and actually fought the battle. But when it came back with the spoil, David said, we are going to split the spoil evenly among everybody, even the people who stayed by the stuff. And I believe that that's the way it is in the kingdom of God too. Again, you know, I, I touch a lot of people's lives. I'm not saying that for anything except just to thank God and for the privilege and the opportunity of ministering to people. But I minister to millions and millions of people. Those of you watching this program may think, well, I don't minister to millions of people. But if you become a partner with us, if you help us beyond what it costs to just get a tape set or a book to you, but if you become a partner and start giving above what it costs to supply the materials to you, then you are a partner with me. And every reward and every blessing that comes my way through sharing the gospel, you partake in. I really believe this. And I taught this at the very beginning of my teaching on financial stewardship from Luke chapter 16, that the Lord Jesus, he said, use money to touch people's lives so that when you die, they will receive you into everlasting habitations. And there he was talking about not necessarily you being the one who preaches to somebody or prays for them or sees them healed, saved, delivered, baptized in the Holy Spirit. You may not be the one who's doing the actual ministry, but if you use your money to send me to help other people reach people, then there is coming a time when you die, you will literally have people lined up in heaven to welcome you in heaven. And they'll say, thank you for touching my life. And you'll say, well, I've never seen you. You're from Africa. You're from Madagascar. You're from wherever it is. And you'll say, when did I ever see you? And they'll tell you that when you gave and supported the gospel truth ministry, that you touched my life, that God changed my life. All of these awesome things happen. And I really believe that. I want you to understand that. Again, it's obvious the benefit that your partnership does for me or for a church or for any other ministry. But many times people don't understand that by becoming a partner with another ministry that you are partaking of all of the rewards, all of the blessings, all of the good things. You know, there's times that when I'm by myself and I'm not in front of a crowd and I'm not on television and I'm not ministering to anybody and I'm just sitting there and you look there and you wonder about, you know, am I making a difference? Is it touching anybody's life? And I'm able to go back and look at our guest book on our website and read just every single day about lives that are changed. I get emails sent to me constantly and I have all of these praise reports 
where people are talking about how God has just transformed their life. People are healed. People are alive today that wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for this ministry. And so I hear those things and it encourages me. But see, many of you are partners with me and you don't hear those exact same, same testimonies. I, I wish you could. I wish there was a way that I could just download every good report that comes my way to my partners and make them understand completely how much, uh, you know, of a difference they're making. But what I'm doing is teaching on this and you just have to, by faith, recognize that when you become a partner with me or with any ministry, I'm not saying this just for my benefit, but I'm saying when you partner with getting the gospel out and you help somebody, then all of the good things that they're doing and the people's lives who are being changed, you become a part of that. And the blessings that are headed for them, not only in eternity, but also in this life, all of the blessings that are coming my way or any ministry that you're partnering with, those same blessings are coming to you if you'll receive it. And that's a big if. So you have to believe it. And I just don't think that a lot of people have fully understood the power of partnership. And they don't understand. And so because of it, they aren't expecting to receive these benefits. They don't sit there. And it takes faith for you to sit there and say, well, everything that Andrew's doing and the people's lives that he's touching, the people that are being saved and delivered, I'm a part of that. You have to minister this to yourself. You have to intentionally think about it. It doesn't just automatically happen. Leastwise, that's not the way it happens with me. I have to encourage myself in the Lord. You know, right here, if you're still in 1 Samuel chapter 30, the beginning of this chapter, I didn't read that, but David, uh, when he came back and his city was burned and his wife, wives and children were taken captive and he had lost everything and it looked like his own men were going to kill him. It, they spoke of stoning him to death. And here's what it says in verse 6. It says, David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. If you were to just study the book of 1 Samuel, David had been anointed to be king when he was somewhere around 17 years old. He was 30 years old when he actually became king, which was just a couple of days after this instance. And so this was around 17 years, or 13 years, excuse me, 13 years that David had had everything go against him. His father-in-law had taken his wife and given her to another man. His father-in-law was trying to kill him. He was being persecuted. He just had terrible, terrible, terrible things happen. And now his entire city was burned. His wives and children were taken captive. And his own men that he had been responsible for for all of these years were thinking of killing him. This would have been a great opportunity to be depressed. And I guarantee you, many people today, they get depressed over much less stuff than what David was dealing with. How did David overcome this? It said he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And then the next verse talks about how he called for the ephod and he inquired of the Lord. The way we inquire of the Lord today is through the Word of God. We turn to His promises and stuff. So I believe that this is saying that David took God's Word, God's promises, and encouraged himself in the Lord. And you know what? This is what I have to do. I have to keep myself encouraged. I've got a lot of things going. Right now, I'm believing God for so much money. I've had people tell me, you are just crazy. You can't do all of these things. And if I was just to think about things in the natural realm, I could be discouraged. I have people criticize me. I have things come against me. I could be discouraged like anybody else. But I encourage myself in the Lord. And one of the ways I do it is to recognize that regardless of what effort I have to go through to share the Word of God, the fruit that it produces is well worth the effort. I have to keep my eye on the fruit and not all of the work. And what I'm sharing with you is a partner. You need to do the same thing. And you need to recognize the benefits of partnership. Just like these 200 men had the spoil split evenly among them, even though they didn't go to the battle. The battle couldn't have taken place without them protecting all of the stuff and keeping uh, track of all of this. 
And likewise, you may not be the one that's on television. You may not be touching people directly, but by sending me or other people, whoever it is that you're supporting that's preaching the gospel, you are touching lives and you have to keep yourself encouraged. You need to let yourself know that you may not make your living by being in the ministry, but you are supporting and becoming a regular part of the ministry and that the blessings that are on me the people's lives that are being changed, it is all coming your way. And you have to encourage yourself with that. You know, I'm really saying this to a large audience and I know that there's a very, very small number of the people watching this program who are actually partners with me. But I do want to specifically say to those of you who have joined with me and are helping me get out the gospel that we're making a difference. We, you and me, we are making a difference. And I want you to get the full benefit of that. I wished I could vis visit with everyone. I mean, I wished I could share the testimonies that come to me with you because it wouldn't have happened without you. You are a vital part of everything that's going on. And you know, if you aren't a partner with me or with some ministry, you need to take the resources that God has given you and you need to share them in getting the gospel out. It doesn't have to be me, but you need to be putting your money into the gospel. The greatest use of your finances is not to have a house and a car and food and clothes. Now, those things are necessary, and I'm not saying we shouldn't have them, but the greatest use of your money is to put into preaching the gospel that will change people's lives. All of the houses and cars and jewelry and everything that you have here in this life is eventually going to be gone someday. But every bit of money that you put directly into the gospel and change people's lives with it, that will never go away. A million years from now in eternity, you will still be benefiting by people whose lives were changed coming to you and thanking you for partnering in the gospel. So I just pray that you get hold of this, that you understand and see the benefit of partnership. And if you could do that, I tell you what, it would not only bless you in eternity as you get to meet all of these people's lives who were changed, but it would bless you right here to know that you are making a difference. Man, that's awesome. My heart is to support Andrew's ministry because he does so much for other people. Andrew's passion is discipleship and, and reaching the world with a message of God's grace and love. I want to be a part of that. I feel like the money is going in the direction I, I would like to see my money go. Really something that I can see the fruit, the results of. We are helping to get the message out, the grace message. Get connected. It really works. It's really sowing good seed.